1984. We're an arts organization that supports artists, cultural practitioners, and Miami's community at large through a variety of initiatives. Some of this takes the form of residency programs such as our studio program, which I hope some of you have had the opportunity to walk around, meet with our artists, as well as international exchanges, fellowship programs, which actually Rachel is an alumna. We also offer direct support such as grants or production funds for artists and curators <coughs> to realize their projects. And of course, like this, we also offer free and open programming, such as exhibitions, seminars, talks, where we bring distinguished scholars, artists, curators to come and participate with us and with our community. If you want to know about everything that's happening, please join our mailing list. There is a nice old school clipboard downstairs where you can sign your name up, although I presume that because you're here, you are on it. Um, before I go and tell you about all of these great people that are with us, I want to thank Rachel for coming back and for organizing this beautiful exhibition on documentary abstraction. Today our guests will be talking about political abstraction and contemporary art, among many other things, which are the core themes that she's basically worked through in this exhibition. Rachel Ricks is a curator, critic, and teacher from New York. She's currently working as an editor of the Brooklyn Rail, programmer at large at Film Society of Lincoln Center, and an editor at large at Verso Books. She's recently contributed criticism for Art Agenda, Art Forum and Ocula, and organized exhibitions for the Knockdown Center, International Studio and Curatorial Program, the Malmo Kunstall, and the Hessel Museum of Art. And as many of you know, she is an Art Center Fellowship alumna where she actually developed this project with us here. So these are kinds of things we do. We, we sort of work together and then we provide a platform for where they can do things. To Quasi Dyson, um, describe yourself as a painter interested in race, spatiality, and perceptual knowledge as they pertain to environmental justice. Dyson's work has been exhibited widely, including at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Dyson has been awarded the Joan Mitchell Foundation's Painters and Sculptors Grant, Nancy Graves Grant for Visual Artists, Visiting Artists Grant for the uh, Nicholas School of, Environment, of the Environment at Duke University. Dyson's ongoing projects have been supported by the Drawing Center, the Museum of Modern Art, the Kitchen, and the Reblog Foundation. Terpazi is now based in Brooklyn, New York, if I'm correct, and she's a visiting critic at Yale University. Maria Lind is a curator, writer, and educator based in Stockholm, where she is currently the director of the Tanzler Film Stall. She is the, the artistic director of the 11th Guangzhou Biennial, the director of the graduate program at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, and the director of Last Piece in L Stockholm. From 2002 to 2004, she was the director of the Kunstverein, and in 1998, the co-curator of Manifesto II. She's taught widely since the early 1990s, and she's currently a professor of artistic research at the Art Academy in Oslo. She's contributed widely to newspapers, magazine, catalogs, and other publications, one of which you will find in the gallery, actually, in our reading nook, and it's called Abstraction. It was part of MIT and Whitechapel's gallery's documents on contemporary art. So after they conclude their talk, we'll open it up to you guys for any questions, and we can continue the chat out there. Welcome, and thank you. So thank you all for coming, and thanks again to everyone at Art Center for all your support with this project, this talk, and everything, especially um, Dennis, Natalia, Charisse, Angie, and Anais. Um, I want to start off by just briefly explaining kind of why we're all here, um, why for me this um, bringing Turquoise and Maria together um, in this conversation. Um, so Turquoise is, of course, in the show on documentary abstraction, and you can see her work um, after this around the corner. Um, she has a kind of lasting engagement with using abstract aesthetics and kind of formal composition uh, as a means of communicating uh, history differently and kind of sort of visualizing feeling and facts. Uh, Maria has also been engaged with the potenti potentialities of abstraction uh, on real and symbolic terms uh, in several of her exhibitions and writings over the past 15 years. Uh, at the same time, she's maintained a lasting interest in the documentary and contemporary art and the potential potentials within that. So the way we're going to frame this is uh, to begin, Maria will do a quick presentation uh, on some of her recent work around this, and then uh, Torgwasi will speak about her own work, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin a discussion after that. So uh, without further ado, Maria? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, being here and to get to know the Art Center a little bit. I will uh, talk you through the project Abstract Possible, which began uh, in 2010 in physical terms. It had been in the making for a couple of years before that, and which is actually not concluded. So if we can get the first image, this is going to be a bit of a schizophrenic situation because I'm not maneuvering 
the computer myself, and I have to see what's on the screen at the same time as I want to talk to you. So please excuse me for either being cross-eyed or moving my head a, quite a lot. So um, Abstract Possible is a multi-year, multi-part project looking at abstraction in contemporary art. It, it has consisted of exhibitions and um, discussions and texts in different uh, countries, different uh, continents even. And it all starts with contemporary art and my very basic observation about 15 years ago that abstraction was returning big time, returning uh, in artist studios, returning in exhibitions. And I started to distinguish between three kinds of abstraction. Uh, the most obvious one is maybe uh, formal abstraction. And uh, I started noticing this primarily in commercial galleries where fairly small scale paintings started to appear, um, seemingly uh, very well fitting for living rooms, etc. cetera. Um, beautiful paintings, uh, but I couldn't really often see more in terms of uh, engagement than decorative um, intentions, let's say. The second uh, was economic abstraction. Artists interested in um, abstraction as part and parcel of capitalism, where value necessarily is abstracted. It's not made concrete and palpable. Uh, and the third strand um, is um, social abstraction or withdrawal strategies, which actually harks back to the etymology of the word. Abstrahere in Latin means to withdraw, to step aside. It actually also have has connotations of death, but that's not what I've drawn <laughs> upon primarily. Um, so uh, for me, this became a way of also understanding uh, the amount of interest among artists and other cultural producers since the 90s in withdrawal strategies, wanting to step aside in order to find more space to, to maneuver, to create more space to maneuver. Um, and I saw this as a form of performative abstraction, um, as it were. So these three strands were uh, explored through the series of exhibitions. Here you see one of the iterations at uh, Eastside Projects in, uh, in Birmingham. I can take the next image. I'm just going to do like this. <laughs> um, and uh, the first of these uh, exhibitions was a small trailer exhibition in the project space of uh, the Konsthal in Malmö, which was just mentioned by Rachel, which um, is a small project space where I had the opportunity to introduce the ideas around Abstract Possible through a handful of artists who became a core group, who in almost all cases then were seminal to the other iterations. Uh, and they are uh, Doug Ashford, Claire Barclay, Wade Guyton, Maitu Piré, and Golden and Senebi. So if we take Maitu Piré as an example, a Geneva-based artist, uh, in her case, abstraction as a formal articulation has been central for many years. But as opposed to the many abstract paintings that I saw in commercial settings, in her case, uh, there was a conscious return to the legacy of the early 20th century um, avant-garde abstraction, uh, primarily in Europe. So in this case, she has uh, borrowed a pattern from um, the uh, Soviet, Russian and Soviet artist Varvara Stepanova, who was one of the the constructivists who really went into production and had uh, fabrics made in factories uh, using this new, for them, utopian abstract language. Dog Ashford, extremely important for my thinking around abstraction. Somebody who's known as a member of Group Material, the legendary um, collective who worked with, with uh, social practice type, politically motivated work since 1976 or 79, basically, and who about 10 years ago, all of a, started, all of a sudden, uh, 
moved into uh, a studio with his work and began solitary work with small paintings. This one is about this size. Um, and it actually originated in an interest from his side to map the New York art world and people there who were active as activists in a political sense. And of course, if you start to, to look through diagrams and, and mapping, that is one form of abstraction, how you condense a lot of information in legible forms. And that ended up being a beautiful series of icon-like paintings, which often uh, include a piece of newspaper uh, clipping. And most of them in this particular series are from the US and from people coming together in the streets in the US, often in relation to the civil rights movement. So there is a direct link between um, what otherwise documentary practices are uh, often considered to be dealing with and a highly formalized abstract language. Goldin and Senebi, a Stockholm-based duo who for the last 10 years have been looking at the finance economy and uh, performance in different ways. And uh, they have also latched on to post-Fordist production methods in their multi-formal uh, uh, work, which often borrows methods from the finance economy itself, but then uh, subverting it from the inside. So uh, it's important with this project, as with most of my curatorial work, that it's not about presenting the result of research in an exhibition and that's it. An exhibition is often uh, an excuse and a reason to research something, to try and make sense of something, which is also why I think it's useful to work in series over time. Uh, and also not having an end point in mind, neither time-wise nor uh, content-wise. So the the second iteration um, after Malmö happened as a fully-fledged uh, exhibition at the Tamayo Museum in Mexico City with a number of artists who in different ways have dealt with abstraction involving the three strands that I just mentioned to you. I'm just going to uh, have these images float in front of you and then we can return to some of them if you want to. I can change the image, yeah. And Claire Barclay as one of the core people whose work um, has come out of Glasgow since the early 90s. And as opposed to her peers from Glasgow, um, who in the 90s became known for a conceptually based uh, practice. Uh, she was somebody who always started from materials and uh, techniques, often craft-based techniques, and from there developed extremely interesting projects involving abstraction. Um, in her case, maybe it is more um, in the sense of, of abstracting from reality, the way we remember um, uh, Barr and others thinking, Alfred H. Barr, uh, thinking about abstraction. In this case, uh, she has been uh, working with uh, graphic techniques um, and abstraction. So I'll just, because we don't have so much time, Gunilla Klingberg's work I think is also very important, using logos and um, uh, other kinds of brand signifiers that she appropriates from various contexts and then makes up new patterns, um, often mandala-like, so uh, referencing a certain kind of, of uh, metaphysics of abstraction, which is maybe more connected to uh, new age, um, but marrying it with a highly commercialized context, but not a highbrow one, rather brands that she would find in her local grocery store. And um, this is uh, part of a wallpaper that she has made out of that. 
Uh, in Zurich, there was a small version made in collaboration with a group of curating students at the university there, where there were only two artists, uh, Wade Guyton and Tommy Stöckel, Wade Guyton being based in New York and Tommy Stöckel in Copenhagen, where the floor piece is uh, Wade Guyton's. He is, for many people, known as the painter whose paintings have not been touched by his hand, but he generates them in the computer and have them printed in various manners in his studio, at the beginning at least, often with office printers. And they were coming out of the printer, landing on the floor of his studio. So the piece in Abstract Possible is a replica of that studio floor, which he, about 15 years ago, decided to transform from being a dirty, shabby studio floor in New York. He was at the time not a wealthy artist, and the cheapest way of creating that transformation was to buy plywood and paint it glossy black, which then, of course, became a huge monochrome painting. Um, so he has shown this together with his printed paintings in various exhibitions, and I asked him if he would be prepared to, to, uh, to separate just the floor and show it. So that has been the common denominator for all the exhibition parts of Abstract Possible, that his huge monochrome painting has been there and it has acted as a stage or platform for all the other works. And then at Tensta Konsthal, where uh, Abstract Possible became tripartite. So at the Konsthal, which is located in the suburb of Stockholm, 20 minutes from the city center, um, it was formal abstraction that was the focus. And it's important to know that the Art Center is uh, a private foundation that started as an artist initiative in 1998. We get support that we apply for from uh, public sources like the municipality and the state. But it's a small, fragile organization, um, not really knowing from year to year if we can survive. And the neighborhood is one uh, dominated by migrants. Uh, it was built between 1967 and 72. And today around 20,000 people live there, 90% of whom have a translocal background. These days that means that many people come from the Middle East and from East Africa. So it's, uh, if we think statistically, uh, a disadvantaged area, let's say. So the average income is lower than the national average. The, un the unemployment is higher than the national average. But it's also a place where people are young, much younger than the national average. Sweden as a country is small, 10 million inhabitants. Um, and Stockholm as its capital has around a million and a half uh, inhabitants. The second venue of Abstract Possible in Stockholm was a seminar room at the university at the Department of Fashion Studies where we we put my tu Perez wallpaper based on um, uh, Varvara Stepanova's uh, fabric and uh, Emily Royston's poster Ecstatic Resistance as a way of having the works live together with students and faculty for uh, about two years. So a different modus operandi of uh, artworks. Uh, let's go through here. Just some more images um, from Tensta. I want to show you the third uh, venue. Oh, here. And the third venue was um, an auction house. So um, you could say that uh, the, um, the idea of um, uh, social abstraction, particularly in relation to uh, Emily Royston's work uh, around ecstatic resistance was the focus in the seminar room at the university. And the third strand, economic abstraction, was was uh, teased out, massaged at this uh, auction house called Bukowski's, which is the main auction house in Sweden. Whoops, let's go back there. And uh, here um, it was something that created quite a debate, having uh, a public, not public, but having a non-profit art center like Tensta, uh, collaborate with uh, an auction house. And this is very much to do with, with the understanding of, 
I think my practice historically and also what tends to constell is. So if we uh, just take a look at uh, the front view of Tensta. The art center is located um, in the middle of the neighborhood, a former storage space underneath uh, the shopping mall next to the subway station. And this is what the neighborhood looks like from above, so late modernist housing. And this is the space when it's empty. And this is what is right above. Yeah, so all the artists who participated in Abstract Possible in Stockholm were asked if they wanted to show work at the auction house and if they would make the work available for sale. Um, and it started from me being invited by the auction house to do something. This is something they had done for a few years and different curators, including the director of the Moderna Museet, had been involved, which is the main museum of modern and contemporary art in the country. And... Um, I decided to connect it to Abstract Possible because obviously the tremendous boom of the commercial art market is something that is extremely palpable for all of us, even if, if uh, we're working in non-profit art centers like Tensta Konstal. Not that we have to deal with the commercial art market directly, but the way its uh, success has been described has really affected uh, uh, policy makers and politicians in a context like Sweden without really knowing how it is operating and how how vast it is. So uh, most of the artists said yes to showing work in this setting uh, for three weeks, so much shorter than than um, the exhibition at Tensta Konstal and much, much shorter than the display at the university. And... Um, the, I invited Golden and Senebi, the artist duo from Stockholm, to uh, create a framework for this presentation because this is precisely what their uh, work has been about. Um, investments, new assets, offshore economy, etc. And they decided that I, as the curator, should not be involved other than in inviting the artists. So they decided that the team of the auction house would do the installation. They would mediate uh, the show through press releases and labels and whatever is, is uh, necessary in presenting an exhibition like this. They also decided that as soon as a work was being sold, uh, it would be taken down from the walls to show the development to show the commerce in action, so to speak. So you see the back wall, there is a spotlight onto an empty wall. There used to be a photograph by Zachary Formwald over there, which had been sold and therefore that wall was empty. And the fee that I got uh, for curating this part at the auction house was used to fund this report that we co-published with Sternberg Press in Berlin. Uh, Contemporary Art and Its Commercial Markets, a report on current conditions and future scenarios. And I edited it together with an academic who is one of the foremost people on the pricing of art from the 17th century um, Netherlands and that emerging market uh, until today. Uh, so we were able to bring together a few existing essays and then we commissioned a number of new essays on this boom of the commercial art market. And some people have said that when this came in 2012, it was really the first uh, book on this phenomenon, on the boom of the commercial art market. And it's actually sold out. So I think it fulfilled some kind of function. I think this is my last image, um, and let me just conclude by saying that um, I'm still not done with the abstract possible. I hope to to be able to do something more in terms of, of a spatial presentation, um, and I think it's exciting to see shows like this one and others where abstraction is being explored by different people in different settings. and. Importantly, in different parts of the world, no matter if I go to Korea, to the Philippines, to Russia, uh, to Egypt, uh, everywhere, there are artists who are doing great work uh, involving abstraction. And that uh, alone is, is a reason to continue. And then I hope that there will be a publication. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, so
So I wanted to talk generally about um, my need for abstraction. And the reason I, I need it, um, and one of the things that I've positioned myself in needing it, is to say that I am under um, a kind of history of education as it pertains to economy, space, race, environment, history, um, and global warming, where I'm not quite clear how all these things are connected. So abstraction, I've sort of centered it as a rubric um, instead of a destination of sorts. And under the rubric of abstraction, I allow myself to use other kinds of languages, particularly architecture in New York. Can, is there any way I can? Light. Yeah, it's like right. right in my. We might have to move you. Yeah, it might have to move me. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just. Yeah, Ooh, that's softer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. When I'm borrowing from these other languages, particularly from architecture or landscape architecture, what I'm allowed to do is sort of sift through and visualize these different kinds of histories. So uh, for years, uh, I was trained as a painter and I stopped painting uh, probably yeah, for about 10 years, or I stopped a serious commitment to painting, drawing, or sculpture. And in those years, um, I was really satisfied with not painting because I hadn't found a sort of subject to approach that uh, painting can lend itself to um, and also help me explore those subjects. So it just wasn't, it didn't fit, the form didn't fit. So after I'd spent years working, 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 and I found the language of architecture and uh, landscape architecture and engineering and um, um, kind of the way in which people think about space, um, I was able to then um, go back to painting and go back to drawing and use it as a tool to sort of map out ideas and rethink um, historically important spaces for me. Uh, and abstraction then became clear um, its criticality in my conceptual knowledge, right? So to think about what it means to step back from in information, as you mentioned, um, re sort of contextualize myself through proximity. Um, and that proximity activates, um, and I work in my work in, I think, the most thrilling way, in that I read a history, most of my work is, um, you know, research-based, and then I sort of re-articulate that history through the language of architecture and through the language of um, landscape architecture. So um, the idea of having like abstraction as a rubric, I can also say um, that abstraction for me is a tool to think, think, think these histories through, but I can also understand now reading about those histories that those histories were themselves a form of abstraction. So um, this, sort of, uh, this sort of toggling back and forth between the sort of phenomenological histories of events that are abstraction, and then my using abstraction as a tool um, to sort of re-enter those histories um, is what I'm, what I'm interested in my work. So the two pieces that are operating in the show um, are a story of sorts, um, and then the, this is, it's a story about lynching. In this particular story, um, there were a husband and wife, and the husband was an indentured servant to um, a plantation owner and he had worked his land and the husband um, hadn't received his pay um, and the husband then you know approached the um, the um, the plantation owner and requested his pay um, in that event the husband was lynched um, then the wife who was six months pregnant was then lynched for asking about her husband and I am uninterested in um, the 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 moments of violence, I think that they're spectacle and I'm not interested in sort of reintroducing them or using them as scenes of subjection. I'm interested in thinking about that couple, their love, their connection, their connectivity. Um, and so before um, this sort of moment of violence is what I haven't really been privy to in the history of lynching as I know it. 
So being able to make these paintings um, in this way, using these circles that are symbols of trees within landscape architecture, um, and then there's this sort of relief moment where these geometries are happening um, that sort of talk about land and space and scalar space of, the, of, um, of uh, plantations, but also thinking um, about that demographically, I'm sorry, geographically, um, and using that as a way to point to space, and then uh, superimposing these very sort of gestural marks of the trees to thinking about the innocence of the tree, but also the love of these two, this, this couple. So um, I'm very interested in those, um, the intimacy that abstraction can bring, and I'm also equally interested um, in really being critical of uh, sort of historicity um, that I would label, uh, again, as a particular kind of abstract abstraction that I'm surviving through. So that's, that's all I really want to say about like, abstraction. Can I ask something immediately? Sure. Which is connected to what you said. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're making the paintings? Because they look stamped. Right. So what happens is um, what... So, I, you know, we start with material. We start with a kind of liquidity, right, working on the surface. And I'm interested in using color and mark, transparency and opacity to create space and light. So the circles are different kinds of um, the way in which I approach medium on a brush. Some of it is thicker, some of it is thinner. Some of the um, acrylic is... Um, um, sort of saturated and desaturated as the process goes. Some of it is high gloss, some of it is matte. So the way in which um, I build on these circles is just a, a very sort of meditative mark making that I'm doing over time. So as this, this, this series is entitled Strange Fruit, and from the Strange Fruit series, the circles and the marks um, arrive at different scales depending on the particular um, painting. But these uh, two paintings were um, a practice of meditation, a practice of representation. Um, so I was very particular about choosing one brush that would make um, the marks for both paintings and using that brush to sort to try to make a similar um, scalar mark for the circles um, and just repeating that and repeating that um, as, a, as a meditation on that, that love for those two people and the data, right? So it's also related to, um, or in the back of my mind, um, the how do we record these sort of histories of death, but also how do we not record these, this history of love, right? So um, I'm sort of connecting myself to a couple I know nothing about through these paintings. Um, so. Great. And one more follow-up question on that, because it's always, I think, both interesting and important to know how a work comes about. Um, are you sitting or standing when you're painting? I'm standing most of the time. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Birkenstocks on my feet, yeah. standing in front of the painting <laughs> with a mat down, um, standing over time. I, when I draw, I sit, but when I paint, I, I pretty much stand. Um, in these particular uh, paintings, depending on the painting. So uh, I have another series where the paintings start out on the floor and I sort of, the way I make the underpainting um, is to wash the surface um, with pigments. So I'm tossing the, 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 the surface so that the water sort of, sort of meanders around it and dries where, where it sort of pleases. So that sort of intuitive process, so improvisational process um, allows um, um, a really sort of rich surface then to build on top of. And some of that surface is some often sometimes e um, evident in the paintings and some of it just gets completely covered. Um, so these in particular are started they're on board. So I've cut out shape and, and laid shapes and um, so it's really this one was really about extracting surfaces and then uh, superimposing surfaces on top. So the three-dimensionality, although um, it's shallow relative to um, other um, kind of objects that think about the image object and three-dimensionality, this one is pretty shallow in its surface. It still has um, a sense of um, 
different um, sort of spatial decisions um, outside of uh, a simple frontal flatness. Um, since we have you here and we have a couple of other slides, I want to just really briefly go so that the audience has a sense of some other sort of variations of the work. If we can, I just want to go through a couple of the other slides. Um, so the second one is also from the Strange Fruit series done around oh. the same time. Mm -hmm. um, if you, we can talk about it or not if you want, or we can go to the next, it's up to you. But if you want to say something about this. Do you want to say something? <laughs> okay. One, one, something. one thing. Oh. <laughs> if you want. So, <laughs> this series is a series of six paintings. Um, and this approach to Strange Fruit, like I said, I'm a, I consider myself a conceptual painter. And I was really fascinated on Ida B. Wells's work on lynching and uh, the abolishment of lynching and uh, just reading more about her and thinking about her work as a journalist, what I realized um, as an individual person, what it, take, what it took in that time period to travel to people's homes and really do um, sort of day-to-day -day journalistic work. And what I was interested in is the way in which she planned her work out, like where to go, how to go, um, where to look, where to ask. So these paintings are sort of meditation on sort of Ida B. Wells sort of planning spatially where she would go to research and uh, write and think about um, and, and plan a sort of radical resistance to this, um, to this um, terror that was going on at the time. So the eight are different kinds of um, imaginations where I imagine her mapping out where she should, where she could go. Um, and then, so, and the next one is uh, a site-specific uh, installation oh, right. that um, you dis you discussed in your, you know, in your own text about thinking more generally about kind of the hidden histories and architecture in just in like in the built landscape around us. And so making, making this work that kind of more resembles that and thinking about what's What's beneath, is mm -hmm. that, if that's fair, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um, fair. And then, uh, and then finally, the last slide. Uh, this is a more recent work from this uh, from your Black Compositional Thought series. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say a couple things about that to get us to the present. Sure. Um, so, what part of um, my challenge, and I think your text really sort of helped me think about um, the different ways to approach abstraction and um, political abstraction in particular uh, and different, like Peter Halley's contribution to the, the text and a couple of others, thinking about language and that um, I needed, and also the charge of social scientists to uh, think about language as we work through these sort of complicated histories, these hybrid histories. Um, so black compositional thought is a way to coin a term um, that is based on my work in abstraction that considers, it's a theorization that considers um, spatial movement and movement around built environments, a sort of radical improvisation and plan um, that the body sort of lends itself to in a given space. And what that means is um, that when the, the body is dealing with a building from an architectural space or a pond from a natural environment or a road or a, highway in, a moment of highway engineering or a sidewalk or a natural reserve or dam, depending on the spatial conditions of that, whether that be um, a condition that's set by policy, a condition that's set by um, propaganda, a position that's set by, um, shall I say, um, environmental degradation, that one has to find their body uh, through that space. And so I was interested in the sort of history of West African women who were part of nomadic practices, and a lot of these women were um, pastoralists who created these architectural structures based on not only their movement, but movements of other people. So the Tureg women, um, uh, uh, along with other women, um, were able to build architectural structures um, that were uh, both homes and habitats and holding places um, for rituals and family and culture. 
And so a lot of this architecture was built on the curve, right? So I'm interested in that curve being a form to then um, sort of excavate in the history um, of sort of, um, sort of abstractionist, like a mother whale of some sort. So there's a conversation between what it means to create a curve and what it means to create a bend um, in abstraction, as it, in American abstraction, as it pertains to painting, but it also has to do with a particular sort of um, continental vernacular as it pertains to architecture. So these uh, sort of hybrid conversations or intersections is what I'm interested in um, in this, this work in particular where I'm dealing with a curve and I'm dealing with a space and I'm dealing with, um, and it's made on panel. It's acrylic and gouache. Um, and I bend this curve around to just sort of contemplate, um, start to contemplate a shape language that is both in relationship uh, to the history of modernist abstraction in the States and these sort of histories of um, abstraction and, or curve or shape or form uh, from the continent. So I'm, black compositional thought is a way to um, find a shape language um, that gives a new voice to um, contemporary abstraction and, and gives a new kind of um, uh, ask of this visual language in terms of a representation. So it's a, for me, the, the critical moment in abstraction and contemporary um, sort of painting, drawing, and sculpture and representation is to create a, a, a really, a real sense of dialectic um, between the history of painting, architecture, spatiality, and uh, visual, visual thinking. So, um, For me, when showing, uh, in, in showing works that are more visually, uh, visually non-figurative, um, but also sort of political or, um, you know, or containing of, of histories um, and these kinds of expressions, um, I get a lot of questions about the kind of role of mediation and writing and legibility. Um, and, you know, Turquesa, you have a writing practice uh, alongside this work. And then also just, uh, you know, you, you, you write on, you know, on each individual work that are talking about all the things behind it um, and, you know, make a point of being very clear about that. And Maria, um, I know that, you know, in your curatorial work in general, you are always very, uh, you're very into mediation, you know, very into mediation, very into giving a lot to, um, to people coming to view uh, just about background of the artist, about, about background of why you sort of chose how you put things in space, and, you know, lots of sort of different layers of that. But I want to ask you both about um, just sort of the role of that, like where, you know, where that comes in. There's always a lot of tension with this kind of work um, because people feel like somehow you're withholding if it's not, um, like it should all somehow be, it's expressing itself all, you know, all, all sort of all contained. So maybe if either of you could start talking, you know, maybe just talk about the, t the tension of that, um, different le like sort of levels of approach. I have to say that I don't encounter that position very often these days, maybe more 25 years ago than now. Um, and I think it's all about how you talk about something. So um, as you mentioned, I would always try to provide quite a lot of data around a work, but more like a recipe in terms of ingredients and how they're put together rather than interpretation. Um, and uh, I think it's very important with some context. And what can happen if you don't provide that is uh, this year's documenta exhibitions in Athens and Kassel, where there were incredibly interesting works, but there was virtually no background information in terms of context. And I think that's a failure. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's fair to the work. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you should throw it at people. So. Where do you, where and how do you communicate these things? For instance, um, this is a curatorial uh, issue. Uh, are you using wall texts and wall labels or not? I would always avoid these things because my experience is that if you have a wall label, for instance, people would immediately go up and read the wall label and then look at the work. I want it to be the other way around. So at Tensta Constal, we don't have wall labels and absolutely no wall texts, but instead we have handouts, and I brought some 
if anybody is interested for your, our current projects, where you have all that data plus a bit of background about the work and about the artist. Um, but then I cannot push through these things in every institution. So for instance, at the Museo Tamayo, they knew about my position. So they said a prerequisite for you curating this show is that we do have both wall labels and wall text. So I had to comply. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I encounter that more with students mm -hmm. and oftentimes when I'm giving talks and I think that those kind of questions are absolutely conditional in relationship to audienceship and how, what their proximity to understanding how art functions and how art, art operates, mm -hmm. right? So there's a um, proximity question between people who are familiar and or used to and or um, uh, acclimated to what it means to produce an exhibition. And whether that exhibition be a didactic exhibition at a library or be um, something uh, more distilled where there's just paintings in a white square. So I'm interested in um, that kind of citizenship around proximity to knowing and comprehending um, kind of experiences that other people present, right? Because both the exhibition and the paintings and the work, all of it has a um, situation itself to the performative because there's, there's often always some kind of public. And in that public, those publics have different um, uh, understandings of what's happening in front of them. So my, my response to that is to say that they're, to acknowledge a public that is absolutely familiar with the decision to recently like, sort of remove numbers and remove wall text and understand and, and go into the, the exhibition not wanting to confront anything in the wall at all. Mm -hmm. Like a completely visceral experience of artwork in the space and the ability to really cognitively recognize what that work is doing on any level. Mm -hmm. And then there the audiences that come in and are just perplexed. Mm -hmm. And that could be a, a perplexed relationship to a particular painting, figurative or not. Or it can be uh, a relationship to someone like Doug's work, or Doug's, um, who's a colleague of mine who is <coughs> absolutely brilliant. Um, so it, it, all, it all vacillates, right, between who's looking and who's doing the looking. So my writing takes both of those positions because sometimes I'm completely unclear, and sometimes I'm completely clear. And sometimes I know um, that I don't want to experience a wall text, and sometimes I actually want to experience a wall text first. So to say, um, to say that when, when the wall text is necessary for me, is to say I'm familiar with this artist, and I may, see, I may have seen the work several times. And I'm interested in revisiting and revisiting that work. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally um, into being led by the curatorial statement on the wall. And then I can, and sometimes when I have not, I don't know the work, I don't know what's going on, and I feel and sense that there's some um, kind of mystery there, then I let myself play a little bit. Yeah. Um, if I'm abroad or, um, you know, and then I see a, a large curatorial mission where I think it's the curatorial question more than the individual artist, then I'm interested in that curatorial question. So it, it, just, it just depends, and the writing for me, again, tries to take up all of those positions. Um, and um, because I read a lot of writing by other artists, um, I'm interested in sort of getting to those notions of what it means to... Um, have work that is unfamiliar or withholding or private um, or coded um, and giving space to subcultures where the audience just has to catch up mm -hmm. if they're unfamiliar with the vernacular. So I, I just yeah. think it, rain, it varies. Yeah, I mean, or, you know, or hopefully just, you know, or be okay with the sensory experience mm -hmm. of it too or the tactile mm -hmm. experience of it too, I think. Or admitting or succumbing to just not knowing everything and not being able to comprehend everything. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's a, a real, uh, where it causes me tension 
when um, oftentimes viewers, and that could be whomever, um, sort of charge me with a complete understanding of a particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that charge, I think, is um, about personality. I don't think it has anything to do with the art world. <laughs> Yeah, there is. I mean, I think uh, for me, the reason I, I brought up this question in particular is because with this show, it's come up um, because there is this expectation that with this idea of a document, documentary or documentation, there's this transmission of specific knowledge. And so I've been having been having fun with but dealing with this tension of like, no, just, you know, come and see and feel it. And then there's other stuff to learn, too, but you don't it doesn't have to be this uh, whole package. And that's not necessarily the burden of the artist or the curator. It's a, yeah, mm -hmm. it's OK to have the sort of bits of knowing and mm -hmm. because that's what it's about. And that's what the abstraction is mm -hmm. about. Um, are we saying we're going to open it up now? Yeah. OK. So we can start to take a few questions. Um, and if not, then I'll keep asking questions as well. Um, while you think of questions, I'm going to ask. Um, so, Kwasi, I'm curious if you have had um, in your previous painting practice, if you had uh, an experience with figuration or if that was, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to talk about this. Good. Um, <laughs> when, I was, when I was an undergrad, I studied painting at a place called Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi. And the sort of art department was maybe the size of this room. And we made um, paintings on canvas with oil. No, that's not true. We started with acrylic and watercolor, and we used to paint out of National Geographics or calendars. So I learned to paint in this uh, really provincial way in a very small art school with a ton of heart, but we were sitting. That's what we were doing. We were sitting at these tables. There were no real easels in the, the classroom, maybe two or three. So from there, painting out of calendars and painting portraits and landscapes and things, and I um, just got, I, as I started late, and I didn't know that I had any ability or propensity towards drawing at all. So I, 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 I realized through uh, representation that I could, you know, paint a fruit bowl. And so I went home and I was like, oh, I have a big brother, I can paint, I can draw this fruit bowl, you know. I can do something better than you now, one particular thing. <laughs> So I sat, we sat sitting at home. He was like, and no one knew that I had this thing because um, I was, what, 20 now and I had no particular talents or no particular value really in the world at that time. Um, so I was sitting at the table and I was just like, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I felt that I could, I had something. So a long time I was using figuration just to really, um, um, and it went from the fruit bowl to these, these morph animals underwater. They were rabbits slash dragons. I had a dragon thing. So everything that was sort of wondrous about the world, I would then morph into a painting in some sort. So um, when I got over that, when it stopped being, um, well, I'll say when I understood uh, the sort of power of history as a painting as a genre, then it became much more um, strategic in how to use painting. Um, but initially it was super, super interior. And so, you know, I was really interested in figuration. So I was like, I was drawing like these gnarly jazz musicians with like screaming heads. And I once I, I painted myself as a giraffe because I've always wanted to be a giraffe, of course. Um, so it was just great, and now it's it's different. Mm -hmm. In the back. Hi. I just want to say thank you for the talk. It was fabulous. But I have a question for both of you, for you, the artists. How do you feel about the curator mediating your work, and then also for Mary as a curator? How do you let go of mediating when you, you were talking about the one exhibition where the artist came in and you had to let go of that process? How did you feel about that? How did that go? Did you, that, you include that in your writing? Let, I'm not sure if I understood the last bit. Let go of what? Can you just... Of the mediating, a part of the curating process. Isn't that part of curating and mediating the exhibition? 
When the artist decided to mediate in the auction, oh, house. In the auction house. Yeah. Oh, um, well, for me, art is the heart and soul of what I'm engaged with. And what the artists uh, say and want are always important. And then I try to be in a relationship of, let's say, tough love. So... Uh, to give feedback, which is not always lenient in relation to what the work is about, but it starts from great appreciation and interest. So most of the time, um, it works really well. <laughs> I would say almost always, because you discuss and you negotiate. And um, uh, for me, it wasn't difficult to give up that side with Golden and Senebi and the auction house, because I totally trust them. So... It's all about trust, I would say. And then the question will, after that is, so how do you build trust? Well, I believe a lot in this tough love situation. So keen interest and engagement, but without, without necessarily being lenient. Same. <laughs> yeah, same, right? Because we, um, same. Like how tough love, both artist and curator, I'm not that lenient with curators. I'm not that lenient with myself. So it's just all round. True. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's, I mean, with just to comment on Maria's work, there's something in the, um, the long-term engagement and then also this um, like long-term nurturing of, art, of, art, of artistic practices or, uh, or just collaboration where you go back to the same artists um, you know, time and again in different configurations um, in, with, different, with different new artists. And I think that can be important and, not, um, and can be rare um, rather than you know, curators constantly trying to reestablish a whole new idea with a whole new set of works and a whole new set of artists and then moving on to the next thing. So I think that's maybe, maybe that's part of the trust. I don't know. I would yeah, probably. argue. Um, um, yes. So first, how do I pronounce your name? Oh, yeah. Torquasse. Torquasse, like someone tore something? Okay. Torquasse. Mm -hmm. So it was mentioned earlier that there's a text relating to architectural hidden meanings mm -hmm. that you, you wrote. Or, mm -hmm. So what is the name of the text and where can I buy it if that's something that I'm able to do? Oh, what's the name of it? Do we have the name of it? Um, and then also I'd like one of your booklets. It sounds very interesting. Uh, I'll make sure you get some more of, of, of the so black compositional thought. Or, um, <laughs> um, there's a little bit in this actually. There's some. It begins in here, or there's mm -hmm. some of it in here. I can say that. Um, but then I don't not, remember the titles. Um, but then there's another. There's another text besides this. But this is. So. I also find architecture very interesting. So I really like hearing about the history, and then yeah. So I want to learn a little more. Yeah. So this is. Well. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. Um. So, you know, Rachel, I'll, I'll, pull, I'll pull it up. <clears throat> it's a shame I should know the title of that. <laughs> My own text, right? Okay, I like your passion. You're in the zone. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just forgetful. Um, so, it's, oh, I'll, I'll look. Yeah, you can find yeah, it. Just, can, can you Google yeah, Tequase Pelican Bomb and the I title will come right up. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the full, the other title is in the footnotes. But oh, is it? Yeah, but that's okay. You sure have it? it. You, can ha you can yell it out when yeah. it's... Um, exactly. But this is, like, the first... Oh, you don't worry. Okay. okay. So, yeah, so architecture. And, um, what, I'm sorry, what's the question? Oh, I wanted to Just know the name about? of the book and where can I purchase it at. Oh, it's an article. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an article. article. So it's, Is it it's, in, like, a database? Like a certain, mm -hmm. like you can, database? yeah, you yeah. can. Yeah. You can look it up. It's on Pelican Bomb, and it's called yeah. Black Interiority. You know, it's on architecture, infrastructure, environmental justice, and abstract. Can you say that a little slower? I will. <laughs> I will surely <laughs> <I will, laughs> swipe so fast. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh, I'll show it to you. Yeah, don't worry. It's the same title as in the book. Yeah. I'll show it to you. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you could go back and talk about the last two works in relation to the Oh, which one? Oh, this here? So, um, hiding, hiding in plain sight, you know, I'll just, let me just pull up some writing and stuff. I'll just, it'll be so much faster and so much clearer if I just um, talk about it in this way. 
Um, so, yeah, this is a hiding in plain sight. I'm just, do you mind if I just read no. my notes on it? Um, hiding in plain sight responds to the spatial strategies of enslaved people who hid or stowed away in architectural spaces to attain their freedom, especially Anthony Burns, Henry Box Brown, and Harriet Jacobs. Each of these three people exchanged infrastructures of state-sanctioned domination by converting enslavement into a system of self-imposed displacement, structural confinement, and geographic ma mapping. Architectural spaces um, that they used, uh, Bolt, Burns, Box, Brown, and Garrett Jacobs, are indelibly connected to the convert covert political acts of self-emancipation. I deconstruct these histories through an architectural lens to examine the transpatial strategies that each embody to defy the state. So, what I mentioned, uh, while Burns, Browns, and Jacobs were each born into a complex geographic and authoritative system of um, authoritative system, their subversive ability to escape represented a successful negotiation of the limited systems into which they were born. So uh, this idea of black compositional thought um, is towards a, a, a shape language that um, illustrates, thinks about, toils over um, a kind of spatial um, liberation that these people sort of embodied. So the strategy in the work, um, the shape language is, is what I'm referring to as hypershape. So this hypershape um, within all of these liberation stories is about finding um, an amalgamation or fungible shapes that sort of operate uh, symbolically to talk about that phenomena phenomenological idea of freedom. And that pertains both to, or his to historicity in ship architecture, um, 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 plantation geography and planning, and also a more contemporaneous sort of idea of like space and bodies and ships. So what it, you know what continues um, in sort of hyper capitalist um, white supremacist hoarding state is always the sort of movement of um, movement um, of bodies for labor, you know, and um, new inventions of extraction for um, sort of energy or resources. So all of this sort of shape language is trying to consider that. Um, so when I think about abstraction and the history of hard edge abstraction or the interest in, my interest in sort of geom geometric abstraction is to reuse that sort of um, history within painting but to apply it to a, a kind of liberatory shape language that talks about those, those histories. Um, you know, and I, and I think um, to do it as a visual experience for, for viewers, but when you think about the narrative and all of these relationships to design and schools of design, Bauhaus, Black Mountain, like all of these people were in conversation around a shape language that has to do with a, modern, a modernism that then had to do with industrial revolution. And now we know that that history um, is a failed history that has contributed to global warming and climate change, and now we're desperately trying to recover from those, um, from those kinds of ideas. So this, this, this sort of language, I think, applies to um, you know, the history of modernism as it pertains to slave trade, industrial revolution, all these things that are connected. So it's about um, using that, uh, the, the hyper shape to really create a new language um, that these things is um, symbiotic, right, and related and connected. Uh, so that's what this work of hidden is about, right? Being hidden or being unseen, being out of sight, um, and purposefully so, or out of sight be just because our scalar relationship with the planet. You know, whether it's the, the, the hordes of um, infrastructures in the Gulf of Mexico or a, a sort of contemporary um, sort of, you know, you know, human trafficking, all of these things are in proximity to sight. 
Um, and some of these um, sort of radical acts are also in proximity to site, but with a lens of self-liberation through these architectural spaces, right? So it's, 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 it's a real tension now, um, I think, to use, to think about um, the shapes and the space that sort of host all of this stuff. So I'm, I'm interested in, in that. So can I just latch on to, to this and, and mention something that uh, I thought of uh, when you sent an email with some questions preparing for uh, today, which is where does our thinking stand right now uh, with abstraction? And uh, this uh, thing with visibility and non-visibility, I think, is becoming more and more interesting, the tension between opacity and transparency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, with opacity as a, as a phenomenon, as a, as a notion, uh, if we think of uh, the Martinican philosopher Edouard Glissant, mm. who spoke mm. about the right to opacity, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. everybody who has been subjugated, whether it's through colonialism or in other ways, mm -hmm. historically speaking, there has been uh, like, um, like a demand for transparency mm -hmm. uh, to make yourself mm -hmm. legible, measurable, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence, there is a right for everybody to be opaque, mm -hmm. not to be um, legible in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And then we have transparency and the discourse around transparency and the tensions around these things, because mm -hmm. obviously uh, there are problematic aspects of opacity too, but there are also problematic aspects of transparency. Mm -hmm. The way it's being proposed, maybe particularly in, in uh, Western uh, Europe right now, in terms of an excessive mm -hmm. use of assessments and reporting, which sort of consumes people's working time in ways that are absolutely unhealthy for human beings and also for organizations. But most of it in the name of transparency. But obviously, we also want our governments, let's say, to be accountable and transparent. So this tension, opacity, transparency, I find extremely relevant today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that gets into the sort of the, the, this dual nature of abstraction, right? This, uh, the kind of the possibilities, both, po po both positive and negative, in this kind of withholding and in this, yeah, this hiding. So. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Or are we one more question, and then we can take it on to okay. the general. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you think the Picasso, the documenta in Picasso, is a kind of a failure in providing the background information for Um, I think it's a failure on, on the level of how really interesting artworks were not mediated. Um, I think it worked as an exhibition in some senses, and then I think it was very problematic in other senses. But particularly uh, the mediation, mediation aspect, there was very little um, contextual uh, information in the publications and in the spaces themselves. Um, and if you take an artist um, like um, Britta Marakat Laba, who is from the north of Sweden, who is of uh, the Sami people, which is an indigenous people, who basically has never shown in Stockholm, and she has absolutely shown very little outside of Sweden. This is the first time in her 60, you know, she's 65 or something in her life, that she's part of something which, so many people are, are uh, coming to see and there is virtually nothing and she is of course not alone in that situation isn't that a lost opportunity yeah especially with with the work that has so much to yeah. say and her yeah. if for those of you who were there her work, work was this long embroidery in uh, the documenta halle in Kassel which is sort of a depiction of Sami history. Marvelous. Yeah. People talked about it a lot at least, mm -hmm. but <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes the absences help. 
Um, okay, I guess we have to wrap it up. Um, I want to make a quick plug, which is um, this is the second to last uh, program within uh, attending to this exhibition. The last program is going to be on Tuesday uh, at the Miami Beach Cinematheque. And it's a series of uh, four films that uh, look at sort of different kinds of expanded versions of, of abstraction through a, a visual abstraction. Um, it's really good. So come if you can. Um, it's a nice, it'd be a nice way to uh, sort of debrief and chill after Basel. Um, <laughs> thanks so much to Requesse Maria. Um, thank, you, thank you all for coming in Art Center.